Sorry. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back into our virtual Imperial Lates online studio. This week's Lates is all about our healthcare heroes. And in our drawing workshop tonight, we'll be exploring the connection between care in the NHS and the creative process by looking and feeling our way through surfaces, textures and shapes. As usual, absolutely no experience needed here because on hand tonight are the fantastic artist Sarah and Layla, a patient care researcher here at Imperial College London. They're going to be guiding you through tonight's drawing and chatting about their work as we go along. So before we get started tonight, you'll need three things. A special object you can observe and handle, pick up, touch, feel around, some paper or card to draw on, pencil, pen, felt tip, biro, or any other tool you need for drawing. Um, and as you're at home, feel free to draw whatever you like in whatever way you'd like. We're here to have fun, so take it off piece, do whatever you like, uh, we're free and easy here. Um, so lastly, Sarah and Leda would love to see what you guys have been drawing. Um, so post your creations on Twitter or Instagram using hashtag Imperial Lates. Also use the YouTube chat to comment your questions, thoughts, anything you've got on your mind throughout. And we'll make sure those get to Sarah and Leda as we go along. Just make sure you're being respectful of others when posting. We'll be removing anyone who's posting anything offensive, specific, disruptive. You get the idea. So now on to the fun part. I'm really, really excited tonight to introduce you to the wonderful Sarah who will get us started this evening. So over to you, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, and thanks, Emma, for the introduction. Um, I'm Sarah. I'm an artist and I work in clay and also in drawing. Um, and I also work at Imperial College as a visiting artist. Um, I come in teaching the fifth year students observation skills using tactile observation and visual observation. Um, and we link that very closely with clinical um, clinical learning. So that's why I'm here. Um, and I'm really excited to do a drawing workshop with everybody this evening. Um, before I talk a little bit about what we're going to do today, I also would like to introduce Layla, who I'm going to be talking with. Um, Layla, would you like to say something about yourself and introduce yourself to the audience? Hello. Hi, my name is Layla. Um, I'm a nurse by background and I work in the cardiovascular academic department at Imperial. Um, um, within my film field, I predominantly work in the vascular department and I look after people who have venous leg ulcers. So that's a wound on the lower leg. Um, in my current position, I'm working as a clinical research fellow and I'm looking at how patients access care from their GP into specialist services um, with a um, main um, look at patients with venous leg ulcers, but as a whole as well. And I am funded by the Imperial Health Health Charity and the National Institute of Research. So they're the people that are funding this amazing research. Thank you, Sarah. I'm really looking forward to it. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Layla. Um, so today we're going to do some drawing and it's really important to um, not be intimidated by this big blank page that I've got over here. Um, and I want us to just start with something really simple. So hopefully you've got something to draw with. That can be anything. I've got lots of materials here, but I'm just going to use a plain old pencil. Um, but there's any, you can draw with anything, any pens, pastels, crayons, whatever you have. Um, you can use any paper. Um, I've just got some plain paper to work with. Um, and I thought that as best good way to get started, sometimes this blank page can feel a little bit like, where do you start? Um, what are we gonna, What are we getting ourselves into? So I'm gonna start with something complex and I'm gonna break it down into something quite simple. So what I have here is um, quite a big bunch of flowers, which hopefully you can see a little bit of in this camera. Um, and this is way too much to draw all at once. So what I want to do is to just start by breaking it down a little bit and taking aspects of it um, and just start with some simple mark making. So working with this rose here, I'm just gonna start by just marking out some little outlines um, in a very, very loose way. I'm gonna hold the pencil quite loosely. I'm gonna just draw some simple marks 
just to kind of break that blank page. Hopefully you can see that um, on my page here. Um, I'm just identifying areas. And I think this is kind of like a sort of observation um, where when we first look at something, we want to kind of see the whole thing. We want to look for the details. We want to try and kind of understand it, but we can't necessarily understand the whole thing at once. So all I'm doing is I'm just making some marks. I found these purple bits here and I'm just making some simple marks um, just to kind of um, wake it up a little bit and get it started. So none of this is a finished drawing as such. It's just a way to begin. Um, I think that um, sometimes um, we have a blank page and it could be quite intimidating. And to just start by making some simple marks um, of the shapes that you see. So I've got a leaf here and I'm just gonna map that out very, very vaguely and loosely and just start to learn where I, where my things are in space. Um, and I'm just simply using um, the pencil at the moment um, and keeping it very simple. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, with observation, it's always a question of, you know, where do you start, isn't it? It's always a question of, of like, where is where is the kind of early, the first point um, where you kind of find that way in. Um, I'm just kind of going around this, this rose and then I've got these other areas here and I'm just going to mark those in with some simple marks. So earlier, Leila, you asked me about mark making. Um, what is mark making? And it's something that we take for granted um as as artists it's something you learn when you when you when you first start in art school and all it is really is just is 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 what it says it's just making marks on the page with whatever you're working with so you might be working with um if you're work, working with something a bit stronger like the charcoal um and you start making marks with that you make very strong marks um hopefully you can see this a little bit more clearly i think my pencil might have been a bit faint and you might work with shading so you might make a series of lines to show to show that darkness um, and to show other kind of features and to add depth. Sometimes mark making can be as simple as just a series of dots. Is that something, something that you can be applied across all art disciplines? Yeah, I think so. I think because I often work in clay, so that would be a three-dimensional discipline. Um, so I would be making, making my kind of model making. And often when you start, you just start by making very simple gestures, very simple marks. Um, you might just um, start to map something out before necessarily going closely into the detail. Um, so mark making is a bit like, um, I suppose it's a bit like making... Um, making a kind of initial assessment of something, looking at something very, very broadly, and then breaking that down and looking for detail. Um, so rather than worrying about all the exact detail that's on this purple area here, which hopefully you can see, I'm pointing at it now, um, I'm just gonna represent it with some, with some quite thick um, and, and quite fast marks as a way of starting. I mean, metaphorically, it's quite similar to the way that I would see a patient. I would see them. I would think about what is the most important things to jot down first and are we safe? And then I would get deeper into the conversation and understanding the patient and what they need from us and what they don't need from us. Right. So you'd almost like it's like building. It was almost like little building blocks, perhaps as a way of building up a picture of of, of what someone's situation is or what, what something is. Yeah. Um, I mean it's also, I think it's quite useful to think of mark making. So I think sometimes when we start drawing or any kind of creative activity, there's quite a lot of uncertainty about where are we going with it? What will it be like? Can I do it? What will it look like? What am I trying to do? Um, and so once you start making marks in a quite loose and, and, and relaxed way, you start to break up that uncertainty and you start to bring things in um, and, and create a picture of, 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 create a kind of broader information. Um, so in a way, um, when we have a sort of uncertain blank page, you have to start somewhere. And so you can kind of, um, using mark making, you can kind of begin to build up um, an impression of what you're doing. Maybe that's, has something connected with the uncertainty that ex you experience when you first meet a patient or when a patient first meets you? No, absolutely. When a patient first meets me, it's a complete blank or a GP or a 
pharmacist or anyone. It's a complete blank canvas and there's a total uncertainty of what kind of treatment you might or might not get and um, might or might not be referred on to. Um, but it's about having kind of the confidence to make those marks, say what needs to be said and um, have that sometimes uncomfortable conversation with your doctor or your nurse or your pharmacist to get to get it going the same way you need to get that drawing going you need to start from somewhere yeah Uh, as an artist do you know where you're going when you create art is there a creative process well there's two sides in a way in a way I don't know it's exciting to not know where I'm going and most of the time I don't really know where I'm going um I might know what questions I want to ask, what I want to know, what I want to find out, but I don't often know the answer before I start. So you are going into this realm of of uncertainty and not really knowing how something will work out. And the good thing about that is that if you approach work with with, with allowing uncertainty to be there, then you also allow interesting things to happen. You allow the unexpected to happen. You allow something different to happen from what you originally intended, which can lead you to a really interesting place. Um, Having said that, from a kind of technical point of view, your materials do certain things. So there's there's a little bit of certainty maybe about the way that your material will behave, what the paper will do, what the charcoal will do, what the clay will do and how how well you can control those things. Um, but the uncertainty is kind of the interesting bit in a way, because if you allow that, then you open up, instead of closing down and, and working towards a predetermined thing, you, clo- you, you opened up um, more possibilities. Um, but in your research, Leila, with patients, um, how they're navigating healthcare, where, where do they begin? when when they've got that big uncertain journey ahead of them so it can be difficult a lot of patients begin in the internet which is not what i would um recommend patients do but in terms of actual healthcare, um it is a really varied way of patients can begin patients go to their gp they go to see a practice nurse they can either go to um a pharmacist or a health visitor that works in the pharmacist pharmacy for that first step of advice that first um mm-hmm seeking of um help but it's it's quite interesting that you use the word uncertainty and it's fun in art and that uncertainty of where you want to go sometimes that feeling of uncertainty can be really really terrifying to a patient who doesn't know where that appointment is going to go and what that gp is going to say or what that nurse is going to do um so it's interesting how uncertainty can be different in different circumstances because i feel i'm drawing a cactus and I feel really scared about where to start and where to draw the spiky bits. I've just got like a blank page at the moment. And that, that's my, that's how most pa- patients feel because I have no idea about art and most patients have no idea what's going to happen when they walk into our GP surgery or yeah. into our hospitals. Um, so it's that anxiety of uncertainty, but in other aspects can be really exciting in terms of art. So I'm going to try and get yeah. on with it. Yeah, and it can be it can be exciting in art, but it can also be quite daunting because sometimes you um, you can put your you can talk yourself out of doing something because it's not available, and that's something that's quite nice that we're doing here with drawing. So for anybody out who's watching this, who's participating at the moment, who maybe feels also like oh, I haven't I haven't got anything on my paper yet. Don't worry. Um, wherever you start is the right place to start, um, and you know, in in a way. It's it's about sometimes maybe it's about beginning and how to find that beginning point. So where to start with breaking down that uncertainty, where to start finding things out. Um, I mean, in terms of of your drawing, you know, um, where we don't know what's going to happen and we don't quite know, you know, what's what's going to work. Just making a start, just covering um, the paper. Um, quite boldly and quite loosely gives you something to work with. Um, a nice tip that an art teacher gave me a long time ago um, was when you have a new sketchbook or a new pad of paper and you don't quite feel, feel it's slightly intimidating you, it's slightly kind of, it's sort of saying to you that unless you've got something really good to do on this piece of paper, then then go home, that sometimes it's a really good idea to just mess up the first page and just scribble all over it, cover it with any old thing, and then oh, turn the page and then start loads of pages here because I'm prepared to mess up the page yeah so messing up is good but that's a very different thing um in in this kind of obviously in this kind of situation 
um, to how that would work, um, you know, for you in your in your research. Um, I mean, I suppose the other thing we, that we have sort of talked about a little bit that would be really nice to think about now is the idea of like how we look how we look at things, how we observe things. Um, in my teaching at Imperial, we, we, we work really closely with the, with the fifth year medical students to develop and hone their observation skills, just the skill of looking um, and of taking away preconceived ideas about what something might be um, and really looking, which is very hard to do um, as a practitioner. Um, and I wonder whether, you know, you feel like looking and listening and tuning in to what's around you is important for you, Leila. I think it's important for me and I think it's important for the patient. However, I think, like you said, the looking can be quite difficult for a clinician. That can make a patient feel quite uncomfortable. Though yeah. sometimes very important, uncomfortable silences of listening are what make patients think of that thing that they would have forgotten to ask otherwise mm -hmm. um, and as a clinician looking um, um, intensely and listening to and really listening to patients um, can help patients feel more confident to be able to um, access the care and the services that they need people feel rushed when they come to a GP when they come into a hospital um, and giving people that extra time I appreciate it's not always um, we don't always have that ability in the NHS the way it is these days. But our patients are still the most important thing and to make them comfortable and be able to open up and tell us what they need is really the be all and end all. Otherwise, what's the point in giving them the service? Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because as it, for patients, it can be very difficult to have those conversations because the clinicians are trained to speak to the patients, but the patients, we are not trained to speak to, to, to have that conversation the other way. So it's quite, um, it's quite a it can be quite a difficult sort of dynamic. It can be really intimidating for a patient. And Pete, you don't, we're so lucky in this country. We have so much, we have access to GP surgeries. We have access to care quite easily unless you live in a rural area um we don't even think about how intimidating it actually is even for myself as a patient as a clinician I feel scared going into a GP surgery because I feel like oh am I wasting this, their time is this problem not important enough mm -hmm. but if you felt it was important enough to book an appointment the likelihood is it was probably pretty important um so it's getting over that anxiety of um and not understanding that they're there for you really and there's nothing to be scared of because we're if it wasn't important I'm sure we'll tell you in a really lovely and nice way <laughs> <laughs> I hope so <laughs> I can tell you in my experience of all the patients I've seen over the years very few of them haven't really needed to be there yeah yeah so. So that's interesting to think about um, empowering patients, isn't it? And empowering and, and bringing in confidence. And sometimes we think about something like drawing, like the act of drawing as being something that can, um, as you develop that skill and as you develop the interest in it, that actually it can kind of help you become a little bit more confident confident and help you find a voice I mean that's it's perhaps a little bit outside of what we're talking about today but there's a lot of information out there about the value of 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 patients communicating through art and also of for doctors using that as a kind of almost in the realm of art therapy or in the realm of um, social prescribing and things like that there's lots and lots and lots of really interesting things you can you can research um, I mean for Absolutely. us yeah go ahead Sorry to interrupt you. There's lo there's lots of information, even especially in vascular, um, in information that's just been published of patients who draw their conditions on physically draw them. Patients who drew it in a worse. So, for example, if they had a triple A, so it's a kind of enlargement in the aorta. So, if they they drew their triple A bigger, which was worse, they tended to have worse outcomes than if a patient drew their um, condition smaller and less significant because they had a negative view about it and it's interesting how how, how you're drawing something can have a direct impact on your patient outcomes so it shows how you think of something in your mind if you think it's going to be bad that is going to affect your outcomes in the end mm -hmm. which is really interesting that's absolutely fascinating and it's fascinating to think about um also um the way that 
art making for patients can be very it can be empowering it can be a way of communicating and it can also be a way of processing something that's going on and it could also be something like right now I'm just drawing a bunch of flowers but um, if we weren't having this conversation and I was drawing it on my own it was very it can, it's a very absorbing activity which is really quite a nice thing to spend time doing hopefully some of what we do today will be things that everyone who's watching might be able to take into their own um, you know into their own lives and speaking of which if you if you have got some drawings and you want to share with them um, I know that we talked to uh, Emma mentioned earlier that there's a hashtag um, that you can use so you can send in your drawings and we'd love to see what what you're doing um, okay so what we could do now so I've 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 done a very vague sketch at the moment that's very loose and very open. And perhaps what we should do now is look at ways of doing a bit more with that. Um, so I've worked with a piece of charcoal because I think it's easier for you to see. I was doing pencil at the beginning and I think it was a bit too faint. So charcoal is really lovely um, if you can get hold of it. Um, it's very easy to find in an art shop. It's basically a piece of burnt wood and it makes this really lovely, very thick black line. Um, but you can also do other things with it um, and you can like things like smudging it. Charcoal is not your friend if you don't want to get your hands dirty, um, but it's really great for creating different effects. So we talked about um, just looking at the very vague outline of what we're doing. So now what we could do is go into a little bit more detail. Or that's what I'm going to do on this. Wherever you're at with your drawing is totally the right place. So if you're still working on the outline, then that's absolutely great. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to just start to add some depth by just smudging some of these areas, um, which is going to give me a different level of tone um, and allow me to just create some slightly different shapes. So I'm just using my finger um, just to kind of really gently just smudge that. Um, the downside of charcoal is that everywhere I put this, I will make a finger mark. So um, you have to be a little bit aware of, of, of when, you, when you've got it on your hands. Um, but what I'm doing here is I'm just looking again at my bunch of flowers and just adding in a little bit more detail, a little bit more definition, um, but still just using this one material. Now, if you're using pencil, um, you're not going to be able to smudge it unless you're using a really, really soft um, pencil um, but what you can do is with pencil is create sort of hash create some hatched areas um, I don't know if hopefully you can see this so I'm showing how you could just create some kind of shaded areas um, if you're using a pencil um, and you can create the same kind of effect as what I've done there with the smudging um, We've got a comment here, um, which would be really nice to share with you, Leila, and, and with everybody. So this is a comment from Yanning. Thank you, Yanning. He says, um, health service visiting for me can often be chaotic and confusing, even though I'm a health sciences student. And that's what I found around the world. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I that it doesn't change for anyone, even if you're a clinician, because as soon as you um, come in that patient mode, you you don't think clearly and to, trust me we're running around chaotic as well um feeling the same way i just think the advice i would give you is to be really prepared for what you want to know and what you want to get out of that appointment or that um that visit to whatever health service you're at that normally makes things move really quickly um, so if you know exactly what questions you want to ask that doctor or that nurse, um, you've got it kind of written down in your notes or something like that, you know exactly who you need to see, where you need to be, you're there early, you're prepared. It generally helps to make that service, that experience slightly less chaotic. One thing I would also advise is don't turn up too early because then you're anxious about your appointment and then you have to sit there and watch the health service working around you so even though you're a health service health science student you probably know how the health how the health service works so many people don't have a clue what happens in a gp surgery in the background or what happens in a hospital in the background so when you turn up early to an appointment that you're already anxious about and you have to sit there and watch nurses or doctors running around and um and answering issues for people that makes you so much more anxious um so it's a fine balance between 
knowing what you want, knowing what you're there for, knowing what you need to get out of us um, and not coming too early. That's a really interesting point about not coming too early, isn't it? Because you definitely also don't want to come too late. Don't want to come too late. Thing about what you might witness along the way that has nothing to do with, is not necessarily has anything to do with you, but can have quite a strong effect on you, that environment, can't it? Absolutely, because people around, you would assume people around you in that um, department will probably have some of the same problems of, as you. And your mind tends to overthink and go, okay, well, if that's happening to that person, maybe it will happen to me or if that's how they're treating that person maybe that will be how they'll treat me so it just heightens that anxiety of mm. being in a department and I think people are often really scared to ask us what's going on um because they think we're really busy and we don't have time and it makes them more anxious I've never met a health professional that wasn't happy to stop and say this is what's happening in the department nothing to worry about or maybe you want to step outside um, it's all about conversation and it's all about communication and we're more than happy to talk that through with you. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I think, yeah, that's such a, it's such a good point. And thank you so much for your comment, Yanning. It's a really, really good point to make. Um, I suppose um, if we, you know, what you, what you said later is very important. And I, and I think the idea of, the idea of not coming too early is, is, is very, um, is, is a really, that's a really good tip for all of us um, in all sorts of situations, actually. But then maybe if we do come too early, um, one thing we could do is we could, we need to bring something with us to distract ourselves. So like a book or a sketchbook or something can be helpful if you have to wait for a long time. Um, so, okay. So in terms of our drawing, um, we started looking very, very vaguely, and then I've encouraged, we want to encourage us to kind of look a little bit more deeply and do a bit more deeper observation. Um, and I've been filling in a little bit more detail um, as we've been as we've been talking. Um, and in terms of observation, one of the things that comes up a lot is the idea of looking um, at that first glance when you look at something, um, you see a certain amount of information and you gather that early information. And then when you stay with something a bit more and you look a bit further, you find out so very much more about it. Um, so the idea of carrying on looking at something even when you've done that first look and you think you've seen everything so the longer I spend with my quite chaotic bunch of flowers the more I'm finding in it um, and I think that's a nice thing that that um, that drawing kind of allows us to do so it gives gives me the chance to spend a little bit more time with this um, and instead of looking at it very quickly and finding out a small amount of information I can stay with it and I can discover a lot more um, and that's something that um, is is a real kind of advantage to if you're able to spend time just almost practicing that skill of observation, which drawing can really help with. Um, and that's something that we encourage the students to do a lot. Um, um, and, I, and I think that idea of, um, you know, looking for something and finding that thing and then stopping looking is, is, is something that we all do in all sorts of walks of life in all kinds of situations. Um, but then the discipline it takes to uh, look at that bit further and and take that more attention is is kind of something that you can practice by doing something like this like this kind of drawing exercise as a way of staying with something um, do you find Layla that um, sometimes it's quite difficult to keep observing um, even once you've observed the thing you're expecting but to kind of continually find out more yeah, I think as health professionals, you kind of think you know you know your profession and you know what to look for. And once you've you've looked, you've seen it, right? You're done. Move on to the next thing. It's quite um, interesting. Um, what Yanning has just said. He said, I think that often seeing a second, third, and fourth opinion on my condition that may require a variety of treatments can be nerve wracking. And it's the process. Mm. It's the process of observation. It's the process of these patients. If you've had a third or fourth visit or opinion, generally they start to know more than you do as a clinician. And that makes it even more nerve wracking for a patient. And I think it is bringing it back down to basics, that next appointment, bringing it back to the new, not going in there with those preconceived ideas of what that last doctor told you, what that nurse, last nurse yeah. told you. And again, observing what's happening in your environment there and then instead of taking all of those things that have come from before. I know it's it's really difficult, especially when you're concerned and worried about a treatment that you may or may not need. Mm. And just needing an answer 
from something but like you said that observing and something like this observing um it's really important when you're trying to get that answer yeah and that needing an answer is interesting too isn't it because that brings us back to a little bit links with what we said earlier about uncertainty and about going into going into the blank page going into an uncertain outcome you know making you certainly experience that when you make art you experience that in clinical environments where you don't know what the answer is going to be but being able to stay with that um and 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 it's 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 definitely something that you have to kind of keep honing isn't it um there's a really good question here from rushab um, who asks, are there any other skills or crafts that are good for honing observation skills? Um, yes, there are. All of them are. Um, I think that um, anything that requires you to use your visual observation is great but also don't forget that there are other there are other senses that are important in observation so touch is very important in observation especially in medicine um and so any work with any kind of three-dimensional work so working with clay is really brilliant for observing um any any kind of um activity that allows you to kind of almost close off all those distractions and all the stuff from outside and really find that focus, which is something that certainly drawing is great for. Um, all clay work is really good for that. Um, embroidery, uh, painting, all of those things can help you. Um, and I think also it's important to say that there's observational drawing where you can see in my drawing here that my drawing does not look exactly the same as as the flowers that I've got here. It's quite an impressionistic drawing. It's quite a loose, um, quite a loose and quick drawing. Um, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to look like a photograph. It doesn't have to look like a botanical drawing to be, to involve observation skills and to kind of ho hone that, that skill. It's not so much what the drawing looks like that's important, it's the, it's the act of it. Um, and certainly doing anything, you know, with where you're using your hands and you're using your eyes and other senses is great for, for observing. Um, so, so yes, and in, and in the, with the year five students, I use drawing, but I also use, use clay with them as well for observation skills. So um, yeah, I'm always, I always think there's like, almost anything like that is great for observing. And also because, as with this evening, you spend time with it. So the, as you spend more time, um, you know, you as, as you spend more time with something, you start to unpack it and you start to kind of find out what its elements are and how they relate to one another. Um, I think that's probably the the best answer I can give you. So do anything like that. Um, and also it's good because it's not passive looking. So with, with if you're if you're looking and drawing, you're not just watching something and just staring at it. You're also translating that information and processing that information. So so it's good for that. Um, okay. So somebody has sent in a picture on Twitter, I believe. Um, so behind the scenes we have James and Emma um, who have sent us, who, who are looking after everything and they're gonna, send, they're gonna show us this photo. I'm just gonna lean in so I can see it. Fantastic. It's slightly dark, but I can see, I can see it. Yeah, I can see it. That's really great. Um, thank you so much for sending that. Um, I can't see how big it is, but it looks like you've got, you've lifted it off the page because you've got that lovely dark area um, underneath it. Brilliant. So we'd love to see more like that as well. Um, yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so more more drawings like that. Um, and I can see on that drawing, it looks like you're doing that with pencil, which is great because I, I think my pencil is not showing up. But you can see where that drawing had really not, I'm not sure who did it, but it had, had re that really nice kind of shading underneath. The other thing you can do um, with, with all of these drawings is add dark areas and light areas to give the drawing some depth. Um, so you created in your, with your bottle opener, you had quite a nice shadow underneath it. So it helps it lift off the page. Um, in this example, you can, as you make that shadow, you can also add a very dark line. I don't know, hopefully you can see this. Um, you can add like a very dark, can you see that I've made a sort of dark line across there, which will just help you kind of tighten up that difference between the shadow and the object. Um, and help you lift it off the page even a little bit more. Um, so that's that's fantastic. Um, right. Um, so I suppose one of the things that we that might be really interesting to talk about 
um, given that we're doing this event online, normally we would do this in person and it would be similar, but also different in lots of really, um, really critical ways. Um, that's also true in healthcare at the moment, isn't it, Leila? That a lot of people are accessing, we're all accessing everything. So we're all working online and we're teaching online yeah. and we're, and, and, and you're all delivering a certain amount of healthcare online as well, aren't you? Um, so would you say that that's, um, that's got its challenges or, you know? It definitely the, got its challenges. It's got its challenges, um, well, easily in terms of observation because I can find it much harder to see things that patients are trying to show me by doing mm. things over the phone or um, virtually. Um, however, it does... It does have positives. Um, patients feel much more comfortable in their own home, and sometimes they can feel much more comfortable to speak to you via phone call or via a Zoom or via a electronic whatever um, in their own home, and they can speak more freely than that. Maybe the pressure of having to go to a GP, having to get the bus there, they can't find parking, and now they're stressed, and then they couldn't find the department. Um, so removing all that is. Um, is really helpful however it can it can be really difficult as well there's difficulties in everything and it's interesting how you say where you um you've drawn the darkest section and the lighter section i think it's exactly the same there's a darker side of having to do this stuff online um i'd be interested to know how patients feel how um the public feels um about seeing us and talking to us um via virtual means mm. some some people don't have secure households at home where they can yeah. talk freely and so it's not the answer to forever and we will hopefully have patients back as soon as we can to normal um ways but hopefully we can you know have a have a happy medium for people who do like it and for people that don't like it but i'd be interested to know um how people find it do people find it welcoming? Do people find it the same, or is yeah. it difficult for people? Yeah, and it's and it's it's really interesting, isn't it? Because often we're talking about when you're talking about being able to see the patient, the physical, the three D in the round person, and 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 you know, we have this same sort of challenge in a way with with making art because. I'm making, you know, art's a very tactile engagement. It's physical and it involves materials and it involves, you know, pieces of paper and objects and materials and things that do things. And that's not to say that you can't make art online and it's not to say that you can't make digital work or anything like that but a lot of a lot of making is around um spending time with a, with with objects or or with people, you know, life drawing and stuff like that and it does change the sort of energy around it and the dynamic around it when you're doing it online and that's true of all of our the workshops and teaching that we're doing as well isn't it that it's that there's a different element but on the other hand one thing that I've noticed which has been really nice um, is that sometimes when I've done online events that we've been able to have people from all over the world who we wouldn't have been able to have before who or who might not have wanted to travel to the location so there is like you say there is like two sides to it isn't there Absolutely. And um, if even at the time, like the obs observation and the meeting the person, you can sometimes get so much more from being in a room with a person and observing their um, body language and observing that eye contact and ha looking at them and listening to them. Yeah. And sometimes that's removed. But like you said, um, we now can be in contact with clinicians around the world, share the latest and best research quickly, um, get patients the best care quickly. So there's, there's good things and bad things about it. Yeah, that's true with a lot of things, isn't it? We've got some really nice comments here. So firstly, Shireen, who says this is a wonderful program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And thank you for your lovely comment. That's really great. Um, um, I'm hearing that people of some of the things that people are telling us that they're drawing. So we we have we have some makeup brushes. There's a pink rose somebody's drawing. That's great. I've got a yellow rose, but a pink rose is great. Um, and I think we have another drawing we can look at. So James, do we have a drawing by Maggie Gibson? Wow. Oh, fab. 
That's lovely. So there's a beautiful rose. And you've Maggie has got there quicker than me because we're supposed to be adding colour by now and we're so busy talking that we haven't got to it. So she's already done it. That's brilliant, Maggie. And that's a really lovely pot, plant pot. It looks like you're using, are you using a pen? You're using something really strong and making that lovely kind of strong marks. Um, I really like that. I really like this, um, all of the mark making that you've got going on on the side of the pot. Um, and those that's really strong lines it's like pushing that plant upwards it feels really um it feels really strong and I, I love that thank you so much for sharing it with us um in fact Maggie's drawing makes me think that we should do the next the next bit before we run out of time which was to add some color um and because I've done this in charcoal it's quite it's got quite you know you're going to get quite messy but I've got here um some some pastels which hopefully if I move them there you'll be able to see them and that's a bit like charcoal as well so these make these also make a lovely mess um and what we can do with these is start to add um to add some color and I like the idea of so observation is really important we've talked a lot about observation um and I think we've made a strong case for observation mattering um, but also creative intervention matters too. So perhaps at this stage of the drawing, um, it's we can allow ourselves to kind of intervene a little bit and slightly step back a bit from what it actually looks like to adding our own kind of uh, our own um, colour to it. So I've got this, ye this yellow um, pastel and I'm just going to um, quite... So, so we're getting creative. Do you think creativity can be taught or is it just you have to be allowed to flourish organically? Oh, uh, it's a good question. I think um, I, I really believe that if you give people space for creativity and you give them the opportunity to spend time doing it, that everyone is creative. I don't I, I don't at all think that there's any such thing as somebody who's not creative. Um, I, know, I do hear this from students a lot who say, oh, no, I'm not creative. I, I don't draw. I don't do any of those things. And then often they're the ones that do the most interesting creative work. Um, so I, I feel very strongly that everyone is creative and that it's a question of having access and, um, and time and facilitation to do those things. And I think that for me, that that is also about not just about university study, but also about school study and 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 studying, you know, and and the work that you do in primary school. That creativity is really important, and creativity is 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 there's it's about expression, um, and it's about maybe making beautiful things, but it's also really importantly about creative thinking. Um, and I think creative thinking is something that you develop, um, and it's. It, it, I don't. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's an argument that says that that you're sort of born with it in some way. I don't know. I don't think that that's true. I think that it's something you develop. It's something you work at, and I think it's something that's very important with where, and it's an area where art and science kind of really kind of come together. Is where creative thinking is important. So you know, research bring those skills together. Research doesn't happen unless there's someone creative who thinks, oh, that's that's an idea. Maybe this is where we need we need to look at this or um, we need to change that. But it's the same from a patient level. Um, looking at alternative therapies, looking at alternative health of how when they're <clears throat> um, advised to patients of looking at how we can treat patients creatively and how patients can come and use our services creatively in a way that fits them best. Um, because just because I offer you a certain type of treatment doesn't mean that's the best treatment for you. Um, so it's opening our minds. Like you said, sometimes art can really open your mind and up into how you might go forward with something. And healthcare is exactly the same thing. We tend to think, right, we should be going to um, our GP and they're going to tell me what to do and that's what I have to do. But it's, that's not the way. You can say no. You can say that's not the right treatment for me. Um, and sometimes it's just having the creativity creativity I don't know if it's the right context of the word but to explore that in healthcare the same way you would in other parts of life by art yeah so so it's kind of that back to that thing about being about empowering people isn't it and having the confidence to think beyond just what's immediately obvious or immediately apparent or or kind of immediately available um and to kind of bring those two things together I think that's where um you know when we have art and science 
um, in in teaching or in research. Um, we all work in, I think artists and scientists work in very similar ways in lots of ways, because we we kind of, we, we're, we're sometimes led by a hunch or, a, or an idea that something might be the case, or we want to find out something that we didn't know before. Um, and it requires exactly what you said about somebody being creative. It requires you to um, to sort of put something out there and 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 see and and, and allow that uncertainty to happen and try something out, um, and then maybe find the proof, the, the the kind of proof and the and and the kind of you know underpinning of it comes a bit later. But without that creative spark at the beginning, none of it would um, would happen, would it? No, it wouldn't. And um, I think it's important. Otherwise, nothing new ever happens. You don't create anything pretty. I think my picture is quite pretty, actually. Let's see your picture later, <laughs> if you don't mind. Yeah. Oh, amazing. I mean, it doesn't look anything like that, but... That doesn't matter. Um, in I a way, that's, that's, that's part I of felt, the point. I felt like it represented healthcare. It's very busy. It's very chaotic, as the person said before. But there's lots of colour. They were very vibrant and there's lots of happiness in it if you look for it um but yeah it's a bit chaotic but i think it looks okay i think it looks wonderful um and anyone else who wants to share i think we've probably still got time for for the for for one or two um but i think um I think it's a really it's a, it's a really nice individual expression. And one of the lovely things with drawing is if you if we all sat around the room, if we were all in person, we were all drawing the same thing. All of our drawings would be very different. Um, all of us would see it differently. We would all interpret it differently. We'd all come up with something that was that was different from the person next to us. Um, so I suppose the the creativity can allow that personality to try to sort of shine through a bit. Um, but Leila, do you think that you know we talk about being in a system? Um, and navigating, you know, the healthcare system. Um, is there space in that for kind of individual personality and connections between people whilst being in that very, very kind of dense sort of system? Absolutely. I think, like I said before, patients are terrified and scared to say and to voice their personality when it comes to the treatment options that we give them. But I don't know what's best for a person. Maybe clinically I do, but I don't know what's best for a person in terms of their life and their life choices. Um, so we have lots of people who are very creative with their treatment. We have, um, so for example, a few years ago, we didn't have any vegan supplements to give people who needed dietary supplements. And it took that one person right. to, be, to say, this is what I need. Um, this is um, the service that I require. And those things are developed and in those that those individual care needs to be individual um one size does not fit all um one care plan doesn't fit everybody and it's again uh, we keep coming back to this empowering people to feel confident enough mm -hmm. to tell their health care professional this is how i lead my life and this is how i need care to help it's difficult because people don't all have especially around the world people don't all have the same access to care um so it can be difficult to be um as open as that i think i would hope after this people in the uk would be happy and confident to go to their gp and say exactly how they feel um and just be confident to be themselves and like i said creative with your um health care because trust me you will create care that's better for you yeah, there's a lovely comment actually from Mandeep here that that sort of speaks very much to that when she says, I used to feel anxious about seeing GPs with bad experience. Years later, I saw a different GP about the same issue and she was amazing. The only thing she did differently was listen. I see that's that's just amazing, isn't it? That the the the, the simplicity of being able to listen um and and spend time and, and really take notice. Um that's really nice to hear that. Um but I think it's it's a very important skill, it can, isn't it? It can make all the difference because I can talk people's ears off about what I think is the right treatment for them, but that doesn't help someone if they don't feel like they're understood. Um, but I think maybe sometimes British politeness stops us from saying, wait a minute, just need to get this out, just need to explain this to you. And especially when you're nervous and anxious and you don't know how the system works, it can be really... Um, it can be really intimidating to say that but yeah I think it I would it comes it comes with um 
experience, knowing when to stop and listen yes. to a person, um, yeah. and knowing when to carry on. Yeah, that's brilliant. We well, have a twist experience. I'm glad. Yeah, same. That's really good to hear that. Um, so James tells me we have another Twitter picture to look at. Is that available to have a look at? Oh, fantastic. Oh, look at that. First of all, it's a beautiful plant. And second of all, it's a beautiful drawing. I love where you've got such a um, really lovely distinction between the light and shade. And that's really beautiful. And that looks to me like it's pencil. It's very subtle and beautiful um, and quite sensitive treatment of, of the plant and the pot. Um, that's really, really lovely. And I love that um, the way you've got that bit of reflected light at the bottom, which looks like it might be, is it some gold on the bottom of the pot? But you've got that just at the bottom of the picture. That's really, really great. Um, thanks so much for sharing that. I love that. It's a lovely plant as well. Um, I suppose that sort of brings me to just return to that question of, of uncertainty again. Um, so, which maybe that's something that we might sort of more or less wrap up on, um, is the idea of uncertainty. So when we began this evening, I didn't know what I was gonna draw. I knew what I was gonna draw, but I didn't know how I was gonna draw it and I didn't know what it would turn out like. Um, and that's part of, of that experience. Um, and, you know, we've talked a little bit this evening about how we can break down uncertainty and how we use observation to try to do that and experience. Um, I suppose a question for you, um, Leila, would be when when it comes to uncertainty or when there's, you know, we, we've kind of assumed that we can get over uncert un uncertainty by doing things, but sometimes uncertainty remains. And despite all the observation, despite the conversations, there's still that la those layers of uncertainty. As a healthcare practitioner, when you're faced with that sort of situation, how do you navigate that? How do you feel about that and it's get around it? Because sometimes there's never an answer to a problem in healthcare. We don't have all the answers. Um, healthcare isn't finite. We don't know um, how to fix every problem, but we most of the time do know how to manage things. And it's looking at a person as a whole and it's making sure that your clinician can look at you as a whole and you're giving them that information to look at how, OK, I can't fix this problem, but can I fix these other five problems that are being caused by that problem? Um, because it's difficult. But like I said, we don't have an answer to everything. Um, and sometimes that anxiety will continue and it's learning how to manage those um those unknowns and it's learning how to gain, get support from your GP or get support from local mental health services or get support from your hospital or a local group um, to be able to support those uncertainties and the feelings that come with those uncertainties. No one is expecting you to go away and to be completely fine with it. Um, it's just about, like I said, trying to access all the care that you possibly can so we can fix every other, try and address every other issue that's being caused by that issue that we can't fix. And there's so much, so many services out there that people don't access and people don't know about. Um, and I know people feel rushed when they get, go to their GP, but having that time to really ask them or ask their nurse, OK, can't fix this, but what can I do about that? Yeah. Yeah. And that's also acknowledging, isn't it, that we are um, we're, it, that the, lots of these sorts of things are connected and that we're not we're not just identified by our conditions and that also those conditions relate to other conditions and they relate to our general overall well-being as well don't they yeah and it's not all about your your one condition you aren't like you said you're not you're not your condition you're not your arthritis you're not your heart disease you're not your toe amputation I'm trying to think of any other thing it could be you are a human and you need to think of that as well as just that problem it's you're much bigger than that problem yeah yeah absolutely so I think we've got a couple more images we can look at before we finish it'd be really nice to see those so if we could have a look at those um Ooh, I love the paint brushes no they're makeup brushes aren't they I think yeah, that's brilliant, isn't it? And that's also really nice. Lots of really strong lines on there. That's really great. And there's also a really beautiful plant next to it. That's great. I love I love that really strong um, kind of confident lines that you've got on both of those, actually. Um, really, really great. Thank you so much for sharing those. Um, and another one. 
Oh, fantastic. Very, very seasonal. I've got an acorn here, but it's um, it's hidden under all that stuff. That's great. And I love that because you've got there that really nice kind of mark making that we talked about, of just kind of working with the texture and just, you know, seeing that mark and just translating that into those 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 lovely green, little green curled lines that you've got that really give you that texture. And then those long straight lines that give that sense of that shiny um, that shiny acorn, that's really great. Oh, I'm loving those. Both of those are really, really good. Um, it's lovely to see what everybody's doing. And hopefully what we've done today, um, you can see different ways of applying that to any object. So it didn't matter what you what you worked on today, um, that some of the ideas around just observing and just making kind of loose general kind of sweeping sort of marks and then working um, into the detail is something that you can apply to lots of things. Um, and hopefully that sort of idea of spending time with something relates, I think relates very closely to care and relates very closely to the way that we develop um, an interest in things and a curiosity. And so I think for me, it's like comes down to um, curiosity and attention and um, and and that kind of thing, really. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything quickly at the end, Layla, before we wrap up. No, I think I've hammered home. Be empowered to come <laughs> and do your GP. Please don't think that COVID is a reason not to come and access care. Wherever you are in the world, I know it's not easy for everyone, but um, we are happy to see you and we are happy to be creative and work around you and try and give you care that fits your lifestyle, not just what my form says to give you. That's um, keep, keep doing art. I feel really empowered with my picture now. Fantastic. Great. So you should. I love it, Layla. Well done. And I think those yeah. that's about the hottest tip anyone could possibly give us right now um, about <laughs> everything. So thank you so much. It's been so interesting talking to you and hearing more about your research. Um, and I hope we'll get to talk again in, in more detail in the future. Absolutely. I hope I get to draw again one day and make time for it. Definitely. Definitely. It's well worth it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I think I should hand over to Emma now. Thank you so much, Sarah and Lena. That was absolutely lovely. Thank you so much to everyone who shared all your wonderful experiences, all your drawings no matter how finished or unfinished you thought they might look. If you wanna share those later in the week as well, please do, we'll still love to see them and we'll pass them on to Sarah and Layla. Um, before you go, we would really love to hear what you thought about the event. So please take a few minutes to do our short survey. There'll be a link uh, in the event chat shortly. We've also got a whole host of other events happening this week on our YouTube channel as part of our Imperial Lakes Online series. Um, so do take a look at the link in the chat and we hope to see you at another event this week. So all that remains to be said really is another thank you to the amazing, I've kind of run out of adjectives to describe them now, but amazing Sarah <laughs> and Leila, um, and to you guys all for getting involved at home and taking the time to draw and chat with all of us tonight. Um, so see you next time and have a lovely rest of your evening.